I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this episode of the podcast. I hope you're all staying safe and well. In the spirit of supporting independent nurseries who are still delivering to customers, this episode I am delighted to give a shout out to Johnson Sweet Peas. They're a small family run nursery based in Kent where they grow all their own seeds. The nursery is not open to the public but they sell online and usually at plant fairs in the South East. They have an extensive breeding programme and Philip Johnson has been growing sweet peas for over 40 years. These days he's heavily involved with the RHS Herbaceous Committee He's the chair of the National Sweet Pea Society. He still manages to find time to answer queries and offer advice. You can order from their website, www.johnsonsweetpeas.co.uk, where you'll find grown advice, seeds and young plants for sale. Thank you to Johnson's for the amazing work you do with sweet peas, which long-time listeners will know is the one flower I can't live without in my garden each year. And a massive thank you to you if you go to their website and support them at this difficult time. So on to the interview, and this week I'm speaking to butterfly expert Peter Eels. If you're interested in encouraging more butterflies into your garden and you'd like to know what plants to grow to encourage them, we discuss how you can be a better gardener for butterflies and it doesn't stop at growing some buddleia. Peter is the author of the book Life Cycles of British and Irish Butterflies, which he describes as taking two years to write, 20 years to obtain the photos needed and a lifetime of study. The book is the definitive guide to UK butterflies and documents the different life stages from adults down to the smallest eggs. I started asking him about the motivation behind writing the book. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, I think I probably have to start with ex- by explaining the inspiration and then I'll discuss the motivation because the, the motivation evolved as a result of um, uh, having that inspiration. And the inspiration comes from a guy called Frederick Frohawk who wrote uh, a fairly well-known set of volumes which he published in a book called The Natural History of British Butterflies which came out in 1924 uh, which sounds a very long time ago but it's been the only book that's covered all of the British butterflies all of the different stages and importantly something called all of the larval instars so as we know every butterfly goes through four stages in its development from an egg to a caterpillar to a chrysalis and then the adult but the caterpillar itself goes through a number of changes. So every time it changes its skin, it sometimes changes appearance. Um, so he also documented every single, um, what we call an instar, which is the period between skin changes. And nothing has been uh, close to re- reproducing that um, since 1924, as I mentioned. Um, so the thought I had was that actually that kind of work could be brought up to date. So with the advent of especially digital photography, and the army of butterfly enthusiasts out there that um, you know take photos of everything that they find out in the wild. I just felt that there would be a possibility of actually replicating Frohawk using modern day technology and potentially producing images that he was unable to uh, to provide. Um, especially because not only did, did, did he not have um, you know advanced photographic equipment, of course. But a lot of the things he did were drawn life size, so it's very difficult to distinguish between, um, you know, one egg and another potentially, or certainly an early, uh, early instar as we call it, caterpillar from another. Um, so that was really the inspiration was to replicate Frohawk's work. And then what happened in terms of motivation was not just to provide a, a, a work that really uh, brought Frohawk's work up to date, but make it relevant in terms of conservation. Um, so I read various conservation papers, um, which had been produced by scientists uh, who were studying certain species, and their work really relies on the correct identification of the butterflies, their immature stages, so the egg, the caterpillar, and the chrysalis, and each of these larval instars, as they're called. Um, and I thought anything that could contribute uh, in some way, some small way, to helping with that identification would ultimately go on to help conservation efforts. So you can only conserve what you um, identify really and recognise, and therefore, um, you know, something that would help with that, uh, I felt would be useful. And that's really the the motivation for the book. Brilliant. Yeah, there there is a bit of a dearth of literature out there. Um, specifically for me as a gardener, I do find that it's hard to actually get 
books that that actually work for me as a lay person but also Mm -hmm. that that really describe what there is but I I guess there's such a huge kind of range of of different um insects that it's actually hard to catalogue them all but I was quite surprised by how many British butterfly species there are can you tell us how many there are yeah sure well um if we talk about the resident species and what we call regular migrants then there are 59 um so that then um, so a couple of the regular migrants are things like Red Admiral, uh, Painted Lady. So there was quite an influx last year. Uh, and even some of our resident species are supplemented with migrants. So even the cabbage whites that we see in our gardens, so the large white and the small whites, as they're uh, more correctly known, um, actually come over as migrants as well. So um, so our poor allotment holders are uh, inundated with these cabbage whites, both from residents and migrants when they when they come in. So in terms of, um, you know, the number of species um, and what I've focused on for the book were those 59 residents and regular migrants. Um, but we do have um, rare migrants that sometimes come in as well um, and they're coming over from the continent. So species like the long-tailed blue, which is being seen on the south coast, um, especially in uh, places like Hampshire and Sussex, we know that they've actually managed to get across the channel. Uh, they've laid eggs, they've um, bred. Um, unfortunately, with the um, fairly cool winters that we have, they're not as cold as they used to be. It does appear that those migrants aren't able to uh, survive our winters still. But who knows, over time with climate change, that may increase the number to um, you know, more than the 59 that we currently consider residents or regular migrants. And then, of course, we have very, very, very rare migrants. So there are species like the Camberwell Beauty, a scarce tortoise shell, which sometimes turn up on our shores. Uh, we also have a few extinctions as well, so we don't tend to include those in the list of things that we're looking at um, in this day and age. But there are species like the large copper and mazarine blue, which um, were once found in, in Britain, but are no longer found here. So uh, so the 59 species. Then, of course, if you multiply that up with by, um, well, if you're interested in butterflies, it's not just the adults that we're necessarily looking for. You know, every butterfly has got four stages. So the egg, the caterpillar, the chrysalis and the adult. Um, so if you multiply those two numbers together, so, so the 59 times the four stages, then we're talking about 236 things that you could be uh, interested in finding. And a lot of butterfly recorders are. So, um, you know, we will go out into uh, into the field, as it were, and uh, see what we can find. And then if you add, uh, so I mentioned the larval instars uh, earlier, and the, the focus of the book I've written, uh, you'll just have to take it from me. If you add all of those instars to the total, then you actually end up with around about 460 subjects of interest. Uh, and that's really what makes the book fairly unique, is that it covers all of those different um, different subjects with um, you know photos and descriptions and so on and so on. So it's a kind, kind of been a lifelong uh, labour of love, I suppose, but uh, a life's work finally coming to fruition. Yeah, I bet. Talk about moving target. I mean, they're not making it easy, are they? They keep changing. They're not. They're not. <laughs> so, or, well, so, and some and some people have already asked, so why didn't you include the long tail blue and questions like that? And you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, may, maybe in a few years' time, we'll revise the book and include a couple more species that are now considered resident and uh, are breeding on our shores. But it's definitely a moving target. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the ones that are residents, are they overwintering in the UK? Yeah, so all of the residents, um, it's kind of by definition, they, they are considered to overwinter, but they don't always overwinter as adults. Uh, so we've got a few species that do overwinter as adults, and they're normally the species we see uh, first in the spring. Uh, so species like the small tortoiseshell, the peacock, the comma, and now the red admiral, and the brimstone, they all overwinter as adults. Um, and like I said, because they are overwintering as adults, as soon as the weather warms up, then they're likely to be the the species that we first see um, during the spring. Uh, but every species is overwintering in some stage or other. So uh, some overwinter is eggs, like the white letter hair streak, uh, purple hair streak, and some others. Most overwinter is caterpillars, funnily enough. Uh, and it could be you know, a very young caterpillar that's just come out of the egg, such as in the silver wasp fritillary or the marbled white. Or, you know, so they're very small, they're probably a couple of millimetres long and have to overwinter. Uh, you know, at that size. And there are some that overwinter as very mature, uh, full, fully grown larvae like the checkered skipper uh, and, and a few others. And then uh, some overwinter as uh, chrysalises or pupae, as we sometimes call them. 
like uh, small white. Um, the speckled wood butterfly actually is quite interesting because it's the only butterfly in Britain that can overwinter as both a caterpillar and a chrysalis. But what tends to happen in terms of what we see in our gardens is the first butterflies we'll see will be those that overwintered as adults. They'll be followed by those that overwintered as chrysalises. And then they'll be followed by those that overwintered as caterpillars. And finally, those that overwintered as, as eggs. And it's all to do with, you know, the amount of time that they need to develop into the adult stage before they obviously then take flight. And we uh, probably notice them uh, mostly as adults rather than any of the other stages. Right. Um, so, yes, yeah, so they're all here in some shape or form, just not always as, as adults. And if they're adults overwintering, is there, can you sort of apply a generalisation to where they might be hiding out over the winter? You can, actually, because if you, if you look at the species that do overwinter, then um, uh, a lot of them are looking to hibernate somewhere sheltered um, and cool. So most of them uh, go into what we call a deep torpor, which is they really do hibernate and um, uh, go into very, a very deep sleep is one way of thinking about it. Um, and in order to do that, they find a place such as a log pile, a hollowed out tree or an outhouse, actually. So uh, so at the moment, for example, I've got a small tortoiseshell and two peacocks in the in my garage. Uh, they've managed to find their way in there at the end of the summer. And they're sitting there quite happy, waiting for spring to turn up and, uh, and then they'll fly off. Um, so. Um, and in fact, it's possible to go out and look in, um, you know, things like World War II pillboxes or other buildings that are cool. Uh, and you'll sometimes find these species overwintering there. And there are some moths that you'll find doing that as well. There's a herald moth, as it's known, which will also uh, exhibit the same kind of behaviour. But there are some species like the comma and brimstone, which tend to um, be found out uh not in those sheltered areas necessarily, but in things like clumps of ivy for, for a brimstone or a comma, maybe just the, um, the comma butterfly has got a very distinctive and jagged outline and it's best camouflaged by sitting uh, maybe on a twig or a branch or something like that, probably still in a sheltered area. But they, uh, you know, the comma tends to be found in more open areas over the winter. Right. OK. Um, so that, I suppose that that brings me a little bit on to habitats. Um mm -hmm. And uh, thinking about it from a gardening perspective, um, it seems from reading your book that a lot of them actually do need quite specific habitats. What are the chances of us re recreating any of those in our gardens? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, you're absolutely right, Sarah. So it's um, it really does depend on the species because every species has particular needs. So, however, having said that, there are some species which um, you can absolutely supporting gardens now unfortunately one of those species is what some people lump as the cabbage whites <laughs> uh, they lump together so small white and large white um, uh, the large white lays its eggs in batches which is why sometimes for vegetable growers with cabbages and broccoli and cauliflowers and things like that um, occasionally you'll see them decimated by caterpillars and there'd be the caterpillars of the large white whereas the small white lays its eggs singly, so it tends to do less damage, typically. Um, so in terms of creating their habitats, well, yeah, you can just grow a few vegetables, and unfortunately, <laughs> you'll be on the receipt. <laughs> yeah, which is an unusual way of thinking about a habitat. But um, I mean, the habitats themselves need to have two um, elements to them, which are, um, you know, the food plant for the caterpillars, but also nectar sources for the adults, because most butterflies do need nectar. Uh, in order to feed up and um, uh, reproduce and what have you. Um, but there are some species outside of the cabbage whites that, um, you know, you can help in our own gardens. I mean, a good example is a, a butterfly called the holly blue. Um, so any gardener who's found a, a blue butterfly flit, flitting around in their garden is almost certainly looking at the holly blue. Um, so as, it, as its ma name implies, in um, certainly the first brood, um, so it has two broods every year. The first brood feeds on the buds of I, uh, sorry, holly and a few other plants, but primarily holly. Uh, it feeds on the um, unopened flower buds. So the caterpillar is, is pretty unusual in, in that it feeds uh, not on leaves, but on those flower buds as they're developing. Um, whereas the second brood feeds on ivy, typically. So it could equally have been called the ivy blue for that reason, because the primary food, uh, larval, you know, food plants of the caterpillars for the second brood is primarily ivy. And, and again, it focuses on the unopened flower buds. 
Um, so, uh, so in my garden, for example, I've actually got a nice patch of ivy, um, which I find caterpillars on every year. And I was wondering where on earth the spring brood, you know, what was the spring brood feeding on? Because I don't have any holly in my garden. But what I do have is a very large cotoneaster, which also pushes out these um, flower, unopened flower buds in the spring. Um, and I find them feeding on there, finally. After 20 years, I was wondering what they, they were feeding on. Um, so they will find these unopened flower buds. But the holly blue, yeah, is, is typically found in, in gardens. Um, and I've also put some plants in specifically for, for butterflies. So, for example, I've got a, an alder buckthorn, uh, which I planted. And um, after the, yeah, nothing on it for the first four years, but then... Um, the brimstone butterfly managed to find it because its caterpillar feeds on uh, buckthorn leaves. Um, and in the uh, fourth year, I found over 100 eggs and caterpillars on on the plant. So they'd obviously found it by then and they've been using it every year since. Um, so when I think about, um, you know, how can I support butterflies in my garden, it's that combination of providing the food plant for the caterpillars, but also the nectar sources for the adults as well. So there are various plants in the garden to provide that. Uh, help to them as well yeah so one of the strange things i also do is um or it may appear strange is i also have a patch of nettles in my garden which i deliberately leave for um because they're the larval food plant the caterpillar food plant for uh some of the garden species we sometimes see like the small tortoise shell the peacock the comma and the red admiral so well actually interestingly there was a book uh, written i think probably maybe late 90s early 2000s and it was by uh, the head of the Sheffield University landscaping department it was called no nettles required and he was saying mm-hmm. oh you know you don't need to leave all these things um you know the, the the butterflies and everything will be just fine without them so it's quite nice to hear actually that you do leave them and and it does take a while to see the results sometimes but actually doing doing that putting plants in for butterflies particularly food plants is important um where could people find out more information about that because as you said with the holly blue you can't really prune your holly some people might have holly that they shape but you don't really want to prune it before the flowers have come but you wouldn't know that necessarily that the holly blue feeds on the unopened flower buds where can gardeners find that kind of information out or is it still something that we're learning you know all the time yeah I i think generally we do know um uh, what the requirements of most of our species are now, uh, unless they're very, well, actually, especially very specialist species on, you know, chalk grassland or something like that. Uh, so a lot of the conservation effort has gone into understanding those species and we know how to manage habitats for them. Um, in terms of gardeners and, uh, you know, people like ourselves who just want to um, do what we can in our own gardens, um, there are various resources that um, that are out there. So they don't necessarily need to buy a, buy a book or what have you. So one of the things I also do is run a website called UK Butterflies. And there you can get um, that kind of information as to what, what food plants um, are required for the caterpillars for each species, as well as suitable nectar sources uh, for each of those species as well. Uh, admittedly, a lot of that is where you would... Um, uh, what you would find these species using in the wild as opposed to anything that we're trying to recreate in a garden but nonetheless the you know the information is out there both in book form and uh, online as well um, and I think a lot of the th- things we've um, kind of grown up with over the years such as you know budley as being a good source of nectar for a lot of species is, still holds true mm-hmm. um, I myself I, I kind of um, uh, took a more general approach. So I've got also got a, got a small piece of garden where I've um, put some meadow map down. So there's all sorts of species as part of the mix that's been put in there, uh, which I find all sorts of insects using. So there's everything from cowslips to, I don't know, wild marjoram, birds for trefoil, oxide daisy, um, different types of clover and vetches. Uh, and all of these things are providing, you know, appropriate um, resources for all sorts of insects and, and butterflies. Mm. Well, that's really good to know about your website. Um, so it, it made me think, are butterflies fussy about their food plants? Um, obviously, they're happy to use buddleia, but are some plants better than others? There are these two aspects that we need to think about. Um, the nectar sources that are used by the adults, as well as the food plants that are used by the caterpillars. And yes, some butterflies are more fussy than others. 
Um, so some butterflies aren't so fussy. So the green hair streak, for example, will use a variety of plants ranging from gorse to common bird's foot trefoil. And I think there have been over 30 different plants that have been uh, identified as food plants used by the caterpillar for that particular species. Some, some are very fussy. So the chalk hill and Adonis blues only feed on horseshoe vetch, which itself is only found on chalk and, and limestone. Um, similarly, the small blue butterfly, which is our smallest British butterfly, only feeds on kidney vetch. So in terms of the fussiness of the, uh, you know, the fussiness of the butterflies themselves really dictates how useful a particular plant is in terms of either attracting adult butterflies or supporting their caterpillars. Um, but it, you know, really does depend on both the plant and the butterfly. So again, I think some of the resources that I mentioned can help you make that linkage in terms of what's the best thing to think about. Um, maybe introducing into a garden if you're near a colony of a particular species, um, both to support the adults as well as the, the caterpillars. Yeah, I think that's really important. Thinking about where you are regionally is, is really important when you're designing and, and putting things in yeah. your garden. Um, but actually jumping on a bit, that, uh, that takes me on to my question about habitats, which seem to be di- disappearing at quite an alarming rate. Um, so if you've got something like the green hair streak that is more generalist, particularly with its host plant um, or its food plant, um, is it possible that given the loss of habitat and, and possibly climate change, that we will see the, the more rare or, as you say, fussy butterflies disappearing to be replaced by, you know, a few species that are more adaptable? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good, uh, good, good question, I guess. Um, certainly, maybe we've got those species that have very general habitat requirements and they've got a widespread distribution as a result. Um, they're often quite powerful flyers as well. So that combination of having um, more general requirements and their ability to travel between different habitats um, uh, or different sites rather um, allows them to be more um, more widespread really um, and if I give you a particular example so the purple hair streak uh, for example it lays its eggs on oak buds and the caterpillar then feeds on the developing oak leaves um, so unless there were some threat to oaks generally then they'd be okay uh, and that being said there's another butterfly which is related to the purple hair streak called the white letter hair streak and its caterpillars feed on elm flowers and leaves and it was actually significantly impacted as a result of dutch elm disease so even these widespread species can be impacted if the impact on the um, food plants that they depend upon are themselves uh, threatened in some way so we saw a huge decline in white letter hair streak numbers as a result of Dutch elm disease. But in general, I think those butterflies that have, you know, either more general habitat requirements or their habitats are fairly easily found, then they're going to do much better um, as a result of, you know, things like climate change. But you're right to point out that really it's the more specialist and the less mobile species which are are most threatened. And the reason is that um, they're either unable to switch to a different food source. So, for example, if you've got some chalk downland with chalk hill blues on it, then if that downland becomes um, uh, destroyed in some way, maybe converted to agriculture or a housing development or what have you, then, first of all, they can't switch to another food source. And secondly, um, they live in fairly um, close-knit colonies as well. So their ability to find another site within flying range of where they currently fly it's sometimes very difficult. So, uh, so for me, I think these issues of climate change, where habitats become unsuitable, or development to uh, development for housing, or other reasons, or agriculture, um, uh, are the challenges that our species face because they find it difficult to move to a, a nearby habitat. If it's too far away, they simply won't get there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, they're the things that we really focus on are those specialist species from a conservation perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was thinking as well about um, climate change. And as you said, th- there's more, we're seeing more butterflies arrive in migratory ones. Um, do we have any invasive species that force our natives out? Um, we don't, fortunately. Um, so, so that's some good news, I suppose. Yeah, that's interesting as well. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's quite interesting if you look at, Because the immediate thought might be, well, maybe there's competition for food plants or nectar or what have you. 
Um, that tends not to be the case. And in fact, one interesting snippet, I suppose, is I was reading a book um, not so long ago. It was looking at, well, why do butterflies actually have the life cycle they do? Why do they go into a caterpillar stage and then a chrysalis and then, then an adult? And one theory is to um, maximize the use of different resources. So typically, caterpillars and their adults will feed on different resources. So, so the adults will feed on a particular set of flowers, but the caterpillar will maybe feed on the leaves of something else. Uh, and that's uh, quite common, actually, in most of our species. Um, so I think in terms of competition, then um, these you know, potential for invasive species, I don't think is going to be a problem for, uh, for most of our butterflies, to be honest. No. But, oh, that just it sounds actually as if it could be a tragedy in the making because they could have loads of caterpillars that emerge, um, you know, or, or butterflies that emerge looking for for some other plant that they're reliant on and it's had a particularly yeah. bad year. And then all of a sudden you've got all these starving different stages. I mean, it sounds, it sounds as yeah. if it could be horrible. Well, and, and well, in fact, some of our species have to handle that already simply because of the number of adults that may be out and about and if. And if a female, you know, different females lay their eggs on the same plant, then there's a real possibility of them outstripping their food source and mm. perishing as a result. Oh, um, and, and while some populations do have these explosions, as we call them, where suddenly there, uh, you know, there are huge numbers of adults flying around because they've had a good year. You know, the weather's been great. Um, you know, the downside is that they can, that can result in the, the caterpillars outstripping their food plant. But that, that's normally, a, uh, or is actually it's an unusual situation. Um, but having said that, there are some species which handle that already. So an interesting species is the orange tip, uh, which is quite a common butterfly that we'll probably see, uh, see shortly uh, in spring. Uh, and it's quite familiar to people who walk around the country lanes because the, uh, the male butterfly has these beautiful orange tips to its wings. Um, the female doesn't have those tips uh, out of interest. So they're sexually dimorphic as we call them where the male and female differ in appearance but what the female does is um what you need to know is that the caterpillars in their early you know fairly young caterpillars are cannibalistic um so the reason for that we think is that the caterpillars don't um outstrip the food plant because if you have two caterpillars on the food plant and um, they both are unable to reach adulthood, then, you know, nobody wins, as it were. Mm. But because they're cannibalistic, then one of those caterpillars would hopefully survive because the food plant will be uh, diminished to the point that they can't feed up. Um, so they lay their eggs on plants like garlic mustard and cuckoo flour, uh, which, again, I grow in my garden specifically for orange chips, funnily enough. Mm. Um, and uh, an interesting thing is that when the female lays her eggs, they're white, but over... A period of a couple of days they turn bright orange and they're quite easy to find on the plants because they're laid on the developing seed pods and it's thought that this is a way of uh, indicating to other females that may be thinking of laying on the same plant that there's already an egg there because it's very um, you know visually it's very um, obvious that there's um, uh, an egg already there so that they don't lay another egg which would ultimately um, result in cannibalism um, and choose another plant instead. So, so you know, a lot, a lot of our butterflies have evolved to cater for the potential for, you know, there being too many caterpillars on a particular plant and do something about it. Yeah, that's clever. Um, well, I've got to wrap it up, really, because otherwise I could have <laughs> speak to you all day. Um, I, I suppose my last two questions are, um, well, it, I don't know if it's as easy as this, but is there a key period that we should avoid cutting back foliage in our gardens or maybe our meadows or our road verges? Can you apply any kind of general rule to that? Yes, you can. Um, of course, the, uh, the challenge is that every butterfly will always be in that habitat, uh, whether it's a garden, a meadow or a road verge uh, at any given point in time. It just may not be the adult. It may be an egg. It may be the caterpillar. It may be a chrysalis. So the general advice is not to do everything at once. So a lot of the conservation management and uh, habitat plans we uh, that get produced uh, encourage a more rotational system. So don't cut everything at once and rotate the cutting, you know, year on year to different areas, because it could apply to verges or uh, hedgerows. So some of our species like the uh, 
black and brown hair streaks lay their eggs on blackthorn. Um, but, what, um, but they lay, lay their eggs often on very young growth, often the growth that gets strimmed away oh. as uh, road virtues get cleared and what have you. So the secret is not to do uh, to do a, a cut all at once of a given hedgerow, but to rotate it. You know, so maybe you have the three-year rotation cycle, so different pieces get cut at different uh, in different years. Brilliant. And that way, the obviously the butterflies have a chance of surviving in the pieces that don't get cut. Yeah. So that's the so that's the general rule. Don't do everything at once. Excellent. That's really good advice. Um, and your book, as you say, it it must have been a labour of love. It is so so detailed. Um, and it's it's exhaustive, really. Um, I have to ask, what was the most difficult species to photograph and observe? Oh, good question. It's it's probably the commonest question I get asked. <laughs> and obviously it's different species are difficult for different reasons but if I had to choose one it would be a butterfly called the mountain ringlet um, it's, its name kind of gives gives away one of the reasons which is it's found in fairly remote sites um, with a certain elevation um, the other challenge challenges associated with that particular species is it's got a very short flight period so before you can find the uh, immature stages so the eggs the caterpillars and the chrysalis um, you need to first find the adults, find out where they're flying, where they're um, mating, where they're laying eggs and so on. And that short flight period uh, can be problematic. You know, it's literally a few weeks and you need to time it just right because it's not always the same few weeks every year. So uh, you need to keep abreast of, um, what, you know, the weather and uh, sightings that are getting, getting reported and so on. Um, a couple of other things that... Um, uh, or one other thing that is a problem for the mountain ringlet, uh, as far as observation is concerned, is that it only flies when it's sufficiently bright. Uh, we used to think it had to, it required, you know, sunshine, and a lot of the sites that you find it at um, aren't known for uh, bright sunshine, such as uh, you know in the highlands of Scotland or in Cumbria. So, combining all these things together, I think I'd have to say that the mountain ringlet is was probably the most difficult. And in fact, it's um, for those enthusiasts that look to get photos of every single British species, this is normally the last butterfly that they'll find. So there you go. If you fancy a challenge, you can do in isolation and you're anywhere near the habitat of a mountain ringlet that's emerged. You could lose yourself in that quest for days, weeks, months. As always, a huge thanks to today's guest, Peter Eels. And thanks to you too for listening. And don't forget, if you love sweet peas, go check out Johnson's Sweet Peas at www.johnsonsweetpeas.co.uk. Follow them on social media. I'll put links to their accounts in the show notes. Go and say hi, wish them well, show your support. Look after yourselves and I'll catch you all next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.